Hi, I hope you're doing well. Just want to remind you of a couple of things before we start our talk for this morning. Uh, the first is uh, to please, please, if you would be able to reply to the messages about the discovery group that I sent, discovery groups for Lent that I've sent out on the WhatsApp messages. Uh, we really do need to be able to hear from you sooner rather than later so we can plan who's in what groups. It, it's going to be a significant time, and I know that uh, the current circumstances make it difficult for us, but, but we would like to offer groups, if at all possible, both online and in person. Uh, so, so please do let us know. We're going to be looking at aspects of what, what it means to be a church from Scripture and how we express our life and mission and following of Jesus as a church. And Martin has put uh, some ideas down for us to, to guide us on that, both in the Sunday sermons, the Sunday services, and discussions in discovery groups. Uh, and we'll be building on that over the next few weeks. So I really would love you, as many of us as possible, to take part in that. So do please get back to us as soon as possible. And the second is just to repeat that we are aware that the government has said we now have permission to gather for worship within certain restrictions in the church building. We haven't yet been able to take a decision on when and how to do that ourselves at St Peter's. Uh, connecting as a group of trustees and the council is difficult because some people have limited access to internet and it makes discussions slow. So do please bear with us and we will communicate with you when we have news on that front. So we're continuing to look at the letter of 1 John, and if you have a Bible in front of you, it really helps turn to 1 John chapter 5, looking at the first part of that chapter, verses 1 to 12. And John is continuing on his main focus in this letter, which is love, love for God and love for people, particularly as expressed in our relationship with and our discipleship of our following of Jesus. And it's in this passage that he, he really starts to, to root that and uh, center it in our day-to-day -day lives, which may seem a bit of a strange thing to say when you consider that this is actually quite a, it can seem a bit of a convoluted passage and some of the phraseology seems a bit strange, but it, but it really is one that asks us to think practically. So again, I've been offering a few thoughts here and then giving you a bit of space with some guided questions to reflect on that now and in the coming week. And his focus here is particularly on what it means for us to overcome the world. He says in verse 3 of chapter 5, This is love for God to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. If you've been a Christian any length of time, you may have seen advertised or even uh, attended talks, read books, that talk in these terms of being overcomers of the world, being victorious, living successfully for Jesus. And, and very often these talks or these books, they offer ideas, they offer step-by-step -step points on how to overcome, how to be victorious, how to, to live gloriously for Jesus. And I'm sure many of these books and ideas and talks are well-intentioned, but, but they very often actually miss the point. And the point that John is making about overcoming the world is that what that means for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, is that the only way we can overcome the world is by focusing on Jesus. It's actually Jesus that overcomes the world through his death and resurrection. And as we believe that he is the Son of God, verse 5 of chapter 5, as we shape our lives around his teaching, around his priorities, around what he is doing in us and through us and in the church, as we shape our lives around that, we take part in overcoming the world as he does. And we, through his work, we ourselves overcome the world, not for our glory and not in our power, in his power, that is how we do it. It's, there's no simple, there's no steps to overcoming the world. There's no formula or program to overcoming the world or living in victory or however you want to express it. It's simply about living a life that's focused on, shaped around Jesus, the Son of God, the perfect revelation. It's not a checklist, it's not a course, it's not a system, it's a life of love and obedience. 
It's not about prosperity, financial security and success. It's not about happiness in the eyes of the world and uh, looking good and achieving success. It's not about health. It's not about having a good attitude on life. It's not about optimism or pessimism. It's not about having a successful and together family who appear to be a good family in the eyes of society. It's not about our achievements, academic or professional or social. It's not about how many good things we do for the poor. Although many of these things will be good in and of themselves and maybe expressions of our shaping our priorities and our life around Jesus. No, overcoming the world may include some of those things, but fundamentally it's about our relationship with Jesus. It's about investing our life in him and around his priorities and his way of living. And in this rather uh, sometimes wordy passage that is expressed most powerfully at the end of these 12 verses, verses 11 and 12. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, writes John, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Eternal life. The life that God wants for us, the life that God asks of us, is about centering, focusing on, trusting, believing in, shaping our lives around Jesus, the Son of God, and everything that means for us. This means that we are living a life that looks for something different to what others may be looking for. It's about, as I've said so many times in the past, a life of faithfulness to Jesus, not success, whatever that might mean. As I've so often said, Jesus talks about welcoming people into the kingdom of heaven, into eternity with God, with the words, well done, my good and faithful servant, not my good and successful servant. Faithfulness may look like failure in the eyes of many. For John, three things matter here, and we see them in verses 7 and 8. The work of God in our lives by the Holy Spirit, our, pub our public declaration of faith through our baptism, the water, and the work Jesus does for us on the cross, the blood, that's in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 5. The work of the Spirit, our public affirmation of faith in baptism, the water, and the work Jesus does for us on the cross, the blood. And that is a threefold action of God coming together to shape us into the people who have the Son, in the words of John, and have eternal life. The work of the Spirit, meaning that it's not just one decision, one prayer that we pray at a moment of decision, although it will include that. But it's an ongoing work of being shaped by God into the person that God wants us to be. But there is also that public declaration of faith in baptism. When we say to the world and to the principalities and powers around that we choose God, we choose Jesus, and the water is a symbol of that choice in so many ways. And it's also about the blood of Jesus, what that achieves for us and in us on and through the cross and the resurrection. A threefold action of God coming together to shape us into the people who have the Son and eternal life. And these are the things to which the attention of the disciple of Jesus, you and me, is to be turned, not to the world. And that is what it means to overcome, to place ourselves in the work and life of Jesus. It's not about our effort but our willing cooperation with Jesus and the work of God by the Spirit. Now, what does this look like? Oh, it could mean all sorts of things, but in our current context, I want to suggest a few 
simple and practical things that may look like, and a few more general things. And what this is about is even in the midst of all the uncertainty of lockdown and everything that brings with it, even in the midst of all the sufferings that so many people, many of us are experiencing, it's about consciously choosing with our lives to invest in the things of eternity, the things of God, the things of Jesus, rather than than the things of this world, which will fade away, which will not last forever. So part of that is being part of a church. Baptism is often understood by Christians as not just a personal act, but it's an act of affirmation, it's saying, yes, I choose the church. And that's both a local church and the church universal. I choose to be part of this family of God. So being part of church expressed through a local church, being committed to that and to the people there, to the work there, that is part of our declaration that I am choosing to invest in the things of God, the things of Jesus. And we do that with our time. We say, I do not choose just the things that bring me pleasure, although there's nothing wrong in doing things that you enjoy, of course. And God gives us things that we enjoy because he wants us to have a full life. But we also choose to invest our, some of our time and our energy and our gifts and our talents in the life of a church. And that may seem difficult at the moment when we're in lockdown and our lives are quite limited, but I would urge us to keep thinking about that. Discovery groups are a way I want us to think about that. Discovery groups are a way of saying, I want to journey with my fellow Christians, the fellow family of God, as John has referred to earlier in this letter, and discover what it means to follow Jesus together. That I may have things to learn from them, and they may have things to learn from me. That we can discover the sort of church we want St. Peter, that God wants St. Peter's to be, and the roles that we each have in it, in this reality that we're living in. So that is why I would continue to urge you to try and take part in the discovery group over the course of Lent. Another way we choose to invest in eternity is preferring the needs of others as opposed to our own comfort. I still sometimes hear Christians say, well, it's very important that we need to make sure our lives are secure before we help others. Now, there's an element of truth in that, of course. You know, if we have a family, even if it's just us living singly by ourselves, we do need to make sure that that we have what we need for life. And there is nothing wrong, as I said before, with having also things, also a few things that we enjoy and that give us pleasure. But we, as Jesus' people, are invited to a life that prefers the needs of others as opposed to our own comfort. Do we think, what do others need that I may be able to give them? We may wish to also mirror the attitude of Christ by cancelling debts. And that, yes, that is forgiveness, and I'll touch on that in a moment, but it's also about literally sometimes being willing to cancel financial debts. There's a principle of jubilee throughout Scripture, particularly in the Old Testament, a principle which it seems historically the people of God, even in Bible times, found very hard to actually live out. But it is there the principled cancelling of financial debts held against others. And much of scripture seems to suggest that, that there is a real lesson for us in, to be learned in terms of how we view the lending or giving of money to others and how we expect or not to be paid back. Perhaps the attitude of Christ for some of us as Christians is to consider what it may mean to cancel the financial debts of others on a micro scale, personally, individually, and a more societal, global level. I'm throwing out questions here that we're going to need to think about and reflect on and discuss, maybe, some challenging thoughts that might need some living out. And forgiveness is part of that. Forgiveness, as we've said so many times before, doesn't mean saying a bad thing didn't happen. It doesn't mean letting somebody off, necessarily. It doesn't mean saying, pretending everything's okay. And it doesn't, and it sometimes doesn't also mean reconciliation. You know, we may need to cut ourselves off from a painful and damaging relationship, but that doesn't mean we can't move towards 
forgiveness at the heart of our faith as a way of investing in eternity, saying there is a better way to go. Some atheist philosophers and thinkers describe forgiveness as immoral. And that highlights for us that forgiveness really is a radically different way of living that must be empowered by the Spirit of God and the work of Jesus. As we have been forgiven, so we seek to forgive others. There's a lot more to say about that. Another way to invest in eternity rather than things of now is to speak up on behalf of others who maybe are not able to have a voice and actually maybe to go even further and enable those who don't have a voice to have a voice. To maybe step aside from the privileges and the platforms that we have and let those who don't have those platforms and privileges take up opportunities for themselves. Quite a thought for some of us. To draw attention to others and not ourselves in a good way. And so many other ways we may choose to invest in eternity. And I leave that for your consideration, your thinking. The point is that this requires active choices from each and all of us, motivated by a desire, a conviction to live in the light of eternity, to invest in eternity, to, as Jesus put it, to store up treasure in heaven, not in the here and now, where it can disappear in an instant. To live to a different set of values and priorities because we are focused on the work of the spirit, the work of the water, and the work of the blood. And that is how we overcome the world, through these active, deliberate choices that affect so many parts of our lives. That is how we overcome the world, by shaping our lives around the priorities of Jesus, who has overcome the world and overcomes the world in us and through us. As we take these very deliberate, practical, small-scale choices that add up to a large-scale life lived only for the glory of God. So let's consider over these next days and weeks what that looks like for each of us and how we flesh that out in our decisions as individuals and as a church.